Well, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, if you remember the melody, and then the, the then you 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 focus on the lyric because the melody becomes um, it's sort of embedded there. So then you know I I'm always I can never remember lyrics, you know. <laughs> Because I'm so focused on the melody. <clears throat> True, but but as Barry said to me, uh, he said, you know, a lot of people actually don't hear music. They don't know music. They don't know one note from another. But they still love to listen to music because of the stories that it tells them. Exactly. Yeah. And because of the and, the and so the words are very very important. And if you can express those words in your in your playing and your choice of sounds and then then you're on a winner um, yeah i think i can most probably pick up on key words of the song to get the overall feel of it sure than focus on the whole thing yeah and, um, yeah uh so actually a lot of the stuff though with the Bee Gees, um i had to play while there weren't very many lyrics there we don't i mean generally what came out of barry's mouth first of all would end up uh, as part of the song, but a lot of the time it would be uh, in the morning, da -da 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 -da, so the breeze, you know, it would be, you know, things like that, you know. Yeah, so yeah. I'd be trying to follow the, so I'd be building the song actually even before the lyric was there. Yes, yes, I, I believe that was their technique that they were there, they had songs in various degrees of having been finished bef when they got in the studio, and then that would that would influence them finishing the songs. Of course, that period of your career, pre pretty much everybody in the world, I would say, knows what you did on those records because it's so prominent and it's so, it was so unique at the time. I don't well, think every anyone- every musician, I think, but I don't think the general public- No, I, actually, I think the general public, when they hear those bass lines and they hear those particular kinds of sounds that you you kind of I mean for me you created what was what I would call hip disco you know the hip side of disco you guys and you and chic pretty much created all of the tropes and sounds of of hip but, disco but that came the, the the word disco came later we never considered yes I, that. I mean, my, my brief was when I joined the Bee Gees that they have to find a new direction. They tried everything and they weren't doing so well. They weren't filling theaters anymore. Uh, even the, the album that they did, which was, was fantastic songs, fantastic production, it didn't sell. And that was Mr. Natural, the album before right. I joined. Mm -hmm. So they were really, you know, they, they had a problem. And so the brief was, you know, to find a new direction. And, um, but of course, once I got to, uh, got with them in the beginning, the first two or three things we did were, were ballads, you know, and I think that was okay. We were just getting into it and getting to know, you know, know each other. And I was getting yeah. to, to play a little with, with Barry and with Robin and Morris. And, and we were just feeling our way, you know. And um, well, but then of course, um, a track called Wind of Change came along because we we were looking, I was thinking, what can we do? I mean, Dennis had already sussed it out. And when he was speaking with Barry on a train in Tokyo and said, look, we're not doing too well. Um, the orchestra's old hat now and everything. What we need to do is get a unit together. And Barry thought that was a good idea. And he said, look, let's get, you know, the six of us Morris can play bass, there's Alan on guitar, I'm on drums. He said, I know this guy um, that I played with years ago in, in Amen Corner, and I think I'd already met them before. And, he, you know, he, he said, let's get a unit together like that and go into the studio and just try and create something as a band rather than thinking of, uh, you know, like these guys and then an orchestra is going on or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, so... That, that was the brief, and I, I was thinking then, I took it off um, the stage further and was thinking, well, people really want to dance now, you know. I was looking at the, the stuff in the charts. And the first thing we came up with that changed the direction was actually called Wind of Change, which it really was, you know. And um, it was like a sort of soul 
ballad, if you listen to the main course album, you can see. And I put a synthesizer on it, just playing, just playing the offbeat of, of the root notes all the way through. So it had a pulse in it and some Hammond organ and things. And that was it. We thought, wow, that, the Bee Gees, they've turned into a soul band, you know. And then, of course, the, the track after that, which really turned things around, was Drive Talking. And the, the rhythm for that came about uh, driving over um, a bridge in Miami. Barry said, listen to the rhythm that the tires make on the bridge as we drive over this. And um, we went over and the rhythm was what he plays on guitar in the beginning of the track, which is... Right. Which is, and that's the rhythm of the, that the car made as it was going over this, met, you know, the metal bridges that open up in Miami to uh, let the ships through. And um, so we got into the studio and I think that night um, we were cutting another track. I can't remember which one. And maybe Barry had been thinking about this rhythm and thinking about this, this track. We finished what we were doing about three, four o'clock in the morning. And Barry said, remember that rhythm I played the other night? He said, I, I've got a bit of a melody, a bit of a song going over this, you know? And he said, let, let's try and put a demo down. Let's, let's put something down. So we went into the studio. It was just Barry on, on guitar, on rhythm guitar, Alan Kendall, on lead, Dennis Bryan on drums, and myself on the Fender. And uh, Barry sort of sang us the idea through, and um, Alan picked up just little, you know, picked up the, just, you know, it, it's in the key of C, so he was playing a C, you know, just little things over the top. And um, Dennis got a, a beat going, and then Barry had already sang me the song, so I had, an, I had an idea of the, the chords, I'd worked out chords on there. But there again, I was playing the melody that he'd sang me because I couldn't think of anything else to play at the time. Because right. I didn't know what to do, so it goes. Uh... That's the melody line, you know. So I'm playing that and then it, and it's just simple. So we get that far and then we carried on playing and he said, okay, there's a, there's like a break here. And he started singing the riff, which is. Right. But that threw Dennis completely. He sort of looked at me and Alan did as well. And he we didn't know what to do because there's because there, there's an, um, what is it? Is there a bar of 5-4 in there or is it bar of 2-4? I can't remember. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a com compound rhythm. That's fine. It's a compound rhythm in there. And Dennis was sitting there and playing. And it, so he just carried on playing, didn't know what was going to happen. But of course, it turned around. And as soon as we went back in there, it's back, it's back around on itself. So it was a perfect thing to do, was to play straight through the whole thing. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah, and that, I, I think it's a bar of seven, isn't it? And then it, he played seven. straight through it, which was great. And um, he and Barry was singing. La, 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 ba, 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 ba. He was singing that, and I picked up and I played the riff on the piano. And then uh, we thought, oh, that's great. We'll, we'll we'll go into the studio and have a listen, see what it's like. We managed to get, uh, I think either the first or the second time we got all the way through it. We had a structure there. And uh, we, and then I said, no, we've got to put a bass on, get Morris, you know. I said, we've got to, you know, we've got to have a bass on this. I said, this is, you know, if, if, if the only way we're really going to feel it is to have a bass on it. <clears throat> and uh, Tom Arodi said, oh, no, Morris went home a couple of hours ago. 
So sitting in the studio was an ARP 2600 synthesizer that I'd been playing yeah. around and uh, that I'd already put on, Wind of Change. Yeah. And I thought, oh, hold on, guys. Let me see if I can get a, a rough bass part. I, you know, I'll put on there. I'll just put a basic, a basic line on there. So, I mean, Morris was playing Rickenbacker at the time, and I was fiddling around trying to get it sounding like a bass guitar, but I couldn't. So I sort of gave up on that one and kept it sounding a little bit electronic, a little bit of resonance in there and filter. And, uh, and I just played a basic, I, in fact, actually I've got, I've got the demo. I've got the original bass part I played, which was just similar, you know. I mean, that happens. I don't think it happened all the time. I think I was doing pretty basic things. And, um, but I managed to get through the track with a bass part on there. We got home, I remember it was about seven o'clock in the morning and we're in 461 Ocean Boulevard looking out to the sea. And we got back and, you know, obviously we're up, you, you know, you know what it's like at the end of a session, you're really high. So bottle of wine open, um, a, a little smoke, you know, we're sitting there and we put this cassette on and we sat back with a glass of wine and a joint and sort of listened. Um, we, we couldn't believe it. We said, that's it. That's it. That, this is the turning point. This is this is something really special, you know. And the way Barry had sung it as well, you know, had as you know, a added another uh, flavor to the track uh, that was yeah. different from the normal Bee Gees thing. Now I noticed that when you're talking about doing this, there's no mention of Arif. Now, did Arif not? He wasn't around. I, Arif, Arif had left after we'd finished this. You know, this was an idea that came just by talking afterwards. Oh, right. yeah, let's go and get this demo down, and we can play it to Arif tomorrow. You know. Yes. That was the whole idea. You know. Yeah. For my yeah. listeners, I Arif Martin, the, the oh, great. Arif uh, Martin was producing. I mean, this this is it. Arif never. Um, he he just left us alone. And uh, this was an amazing thing in this, you know, we were obviously getting feedback from him, but he wouldn't have to say very much. I mean, what he did do was if we'd been going for a long time, uh, he would stop and say, hey guys, you know, 30 minutes ago, you had it, that's what it was. And we'd have to think, and he'd remember what the, what the, 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 the magic thing that happened 30 minutes ago was, and he put us back on track again and we'd do it. And this one was great, but he always left us to sit and work it out for ourselves. He never came in and said, no, that, you know, you, you, you've got to, you know, it should be like this. Or he right. never gave us any um, sort of direction or anything like that. He just let us see where we were going, you know, and see yeah. if we could work it out. Well, um, in, in my two interviews that I, in my two-part interview with, with Arif, he talks about doing this and working with you guys on that and it's it's very interesting and he says you know i i didn't really direct i just enabled you know and and that was that was an interesting thing but he also tells a story and maybe you can add some background to this was that the vocal sound that the the uh the brothers got he he had apparently said to them well you know if you want to get a different sound maybe you should think about doing that kind of thing of the soul groups, the black soul groups, that high falsetto thing, maybe try something like that, or maybe try some kind of vocal harmony thing that that's, that's, and, and they went away and, and he, Arif says he wasn't expecting them to go for that, you know, very strong full voice, you know, sound that they suddenly got, but it was a new sound. And it wasn't that he told them to get that sound. He just told them to do something and they come up, came up with that. Yeah, but that wasn't the falsetto at the time. That was just the, the, the high, you know, the soul, like you say, the soul type voices. Yes, yes. They put in the back end. I'll tell you the story of the falsetto, uh, which came about on, on Nights on Broadway, which right. we call the next track. Um, but um, Arif put them right when they were writing the lyrics about jive talking, they didn't realize they, uh, that, 
you know, he put, he said, hey, man, this is street talk. This is don't give me all that jive, you know. He put them in that direction. Now write a lyric. You know, your lyric has to be like street talk or, or, or right. something. Like that. You know, he put them in, in the right direction for jive. You know? They didn't understand about that then. Yes. And, um, but the next thing was the following night, of course, we, we knew that it was the synth bass that was making the whole thing sound different and putting the weight in the track. And so they, you know, everybody agreed that um, that I should put a synth bass on it. And I think we arrived in the studio about six o'clock. Oh, and before that, I said to Barry, I said, but you know, Morris is the bass player. Who's going to tell him? He said, you. I said, no, you're his brother. You tell him. <laughs> and, uh, Very anyway, brave of him. Yeah. Anyway, um, Robin and Morris used to come down to the studio sometimes a bit later if we didn't need anything. And um, I, we got to the studio about six o'clock and I said to the guys, okay, we're in Studio B in Criteria. Now, Studio B, the monitors were set in the wall. It was just a flat wall at the back and they were inside. You couldn't see them. It was just a whole grill. So I set the ARP 2600 up right against the wall uh, with the little keyboard there. And I said, just give me the drums, you know, turn the kick up, <laughs> let me work on this part, you know. And um, and I, I got in there and I thought I'll make it more electronic sounding. So I made it again, more resonance, more filter on there. Uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of bottom end in there. And Carl was great. He got the, I mean, we, we were working on 16 track then actually, uh, which was great, 16 track at 15 IPS. And um, and that's why um, that album and Jive Talking has that great bottom end as well. And um, anyway, I'm playing away and I'm working on this bass part and uh, Dennis and Barry are throwing a few ideas. And, and again, I'm playing, no, that, that was great what you did there. Let's do that, you know. So I'm working it out and I got about halfway through the song we played and suddenly the door opens and Morris walks in. And I'm, oh no, no. Morris, he said, oh man, Oh, that sounds fantastic. That's that's so great. Oh, this is it. You know, we've got it. And I said, oh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> thanks, Morris. And I said, look, when I finished, I said, this is in C. I said, we can we can put some extra weight on the bottom end. I said, when when I finish, you're going to tune your E string down to C. Nice. And you play the downbeat. That's mm -hmm. all you have to do. You know, great. On there, and so. So he's on there on the bass as well. Great idea. It's not only diplomatic, but also sounded great. It, it worked. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I think also the thing is, let's face it, the brothers had been complete professionals from a very, very early age. So it was very <laughs> unlikely. I would have found it very unlikely that that any of them would have gotten in the way of making a good record because of ego i mean it just didn't i mean it they well I, I think it did happen in the past they had the, they had a few differences but i think by then and everybody knew that this had to happen this right. album right well and, um but like you say you know he, he recognized that 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 was you know the right thing the right way to go Right. And in fact, it was hard for me to get him to play bass after that. Every time, oh no, you've got to put synth on. And of course, the next track was Nights on Broadway, exactly. which also was synth bass. You know. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, you know, it's not just me complimenting you, but you really did by doing that and other sounds that you chose. You helped create that magical uh, and incredibly successful uh sound which you know as i i called it earlier hip disco but it's it's the most sophisticated uh version of of dance music that that was around at the time and changed the way everybody else was thinking well i gotta thank stevie wonder as well you know i mean if you listen you know um my influence is there you know right. when barry sang the riff i said oh we've got i've got to put synth on that riff you know, and at the time I was li listening to Living in the City. Sure. You know. Yeah. Which is, well, it's not, but 
you know, I, the, sure. the, the idea is there. Sure. And I thought like, we've got to put a big synth riff in this song. Yeah. So I, uh, I did three tracks of synth and we put them all, uh, we mixed them all down to one track. And then I said to Carl, that's still not enough. I said, put a delay, put a very short delay and let's spread it out into stereo. Yeah. So if you listen, the, the one side <laughs> is actually a delay of the other. Right. And I added a fifth, I, I, I did octaves. And then, right. of course, I, I had to tune the oscillators to an octave apart. So, and then, and I did one with a high, with, so it was over, uh, over two octaves, but then I did one pass and I added a fifth in there. So it's, um, you know, it's like, uh, right, right. That's just in there a little bit. You, you know, it just added a little bit to the, to the sound. Yeah, that's an arranging technique that I, I use in writing for horns and strings. I use that particular technique. In fact, in fact, I also use I, I, I keep going, you know, I do fifth and then another fifth up here and, you know, and it just cool. adds, it adds resonance to it, to things, but, but it has to be softer, you know, but it's, it's, that's what I mean by saying that you're thinking completely like an arranger. Uh, and, and that's the thing about your particular keyboard thing is that you're enhancing well, because, the track. Also because I don't sing so much. I'm playing the parts on the piano as well. And um, actually, when we get towards the end of the interview, I'd like to play you something which it demonstrates exactly that where I've written a song, but actually in the, in the playing it on the piano, I'm playing the vocal part. I'm also playing what I thought of the string arrangement as well. Lay it on me now, let's, let's hear it. Oh, well, well, the story behind it is quite sad. Um, you know, of course, Andy was the, the first brother, the youngest one, uh, to die. And then Morris and then Robin. Well, after Robin died, I mean, I was in Spain and I, I, well, I couldn't believe it at any point, you know, any of them, any of them, I never, you know, it was, they were three brothers. They sang, we performed. And I always had this vision that one day we would get back together and I would be able to perform them, which I actually did on Barry's, I think it was his 50th birthday. I was fortunate enough to, to be there at a party that Robert had thrown in London for them. And there was a little Wurlitzer, uh, there was a band playing and they had a Wurlitzer piano. And of course, everybody said, oh, the Bee Gees, you've got to play. And Barry and the guys looked at me and said, okay, you've got to play piano. So I, I was playing this Wurlitzer. And um, so I did actually get to play with the three of them, you know, you, you know, oh God, how many years after? Sure. Um, after I left, I forget. Right. Uh, but anyway, but it was so sad after Robin died because I thought there's no way now, you know, that's it. And I, I read uh, somewhere where they said, now Barry's the only one, you know. And I sat down at the piano and I, immediately had a title in my mind, uh, Now We Are One. No. Right. And uh, I sat down and it came to me very, very quickly. Um, I loved playing in E flat. The songs I wrote with Barry are in E flat or F. I knew, he, I know he could sing around E flat. And I just loved playing in that key. You know, uh, How Deep Is Your Love is in E flat as well. Right. So I was working around now this is what I came up with. Um, I came up with a lyric as well. I sat down and I'm not a lyricist, but um, the lyric I came up with was, um, I'm standing on this stage alone, uh, another spirit not yet flown. But when I look around, I see all my brothers standing next to me and singing harmony. And when that final song is sung, then we are one. Great. I don't know. I don't know. And and that melody was. Um,
Beautiful, man. Yeah. But you see where I'm talking about, like there's an arrangement in there. I'm playing the melody line. I'm standing on the street alone. Yeah. wanted them to sing uh, one that holds out the one while it while the orchestration goes and then a little motif that you recognize and so that. I had to I had to finish it, you know, I had to think of another part around it to, to make it into a song. I could, I still to this day can't top the lyric, I can't find another, I can't find the other verses. And there's only one person that can do that. And that's Barry, you know, but I came up with a really unique idea. The first and second verses are different to the, to what I just played. They're the same structure, but you know, the, that verse goes, and now the, the first verse goes, that's all the same then, but I, I don't know how I came up with it. So the first part of the verse is is a different is a, it, it, I mean it, it's just a little bit different, and um, the chord structure, even though it's the same. But then I came up with a middle A, so it goes. Um, I mean, it's all rubato as well. I, I tried to do it on that and I thought, no, it doesn't work. It has to be done live with, with the singer. With the... Yeah. I do also want to ask you about the new Straubs record, but I'm wondering, is it finished? Yeah, it's out. It, it, it's out. it got into the charts on... on, on, uh, on um, it, it got straight into the folk charts the actual um, physical, you know, CDs and albums chart. Right. Uh, it went in at number eleven, I think, or ten. Um, that was on on pre on pre orders. You know. Right. It came about because yet again um, we had another anniversary, a big anniversary, Straub's fiftieth anniversary, and that was held in Lakewood, New Jersey, because the mayor there. Uh, is a big Straubs fan, and they have this beautiful old theatre there, the Strand, and he gave us the theatre for a week, and um, uh, it was all planned. Uh, fans came in from all around the world. He had a hotel booked out there so the fans could book, and we held the concerts over three days, and uh, that was the Thursday, Friday, and Saturday all day from like 11 in the morning through till 11 at night music we got as many of the old strobes together as we could and guests um and it was just an amazing week i mean it was it was really good we didn't have much time for rehearsals and uh we had an orchestra and we had a, a united nations choir as well and uh, tony visconti uh did a new arrangement well he he he, he did um oh how she changed again and oh it was wonderful fantastic 
Um, so we recorded and videoed that whole, uh, those three days. And um, we did a live presentation of Grave New World as well. And um, with a commentary, David written some words. And so it, it, it's a whole structure. It, um, there's an introduction by the speaker, which was Wesley Stace. And, um, and then as we finish each number, he does another, um, another introduction or a little yes, yes. It's a story that, that, it, that the whole album moves through. And I think I started mixing round about August, something like that. I started mixing the live album or sorting right. it out. Did you mix it all there at home? Yeah, I was doing everything at home here in, the, in you know, here. In front of me, I've got um, a little SSL nucleus board, which is a controller, basically. Nice. And a nice big 49-inch curved screen that split in, into two sections. I did have two Mac monitors before, but believe me, if you can do it, this is, ah, oh, it's amazing. Yeah. It's so restful and the... Uh, it's 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 really it really works out well. Great. And then um, I'm using a new door, as they called now, which is not always be a sequencer to me. <laughs> but um, uh, I started off in Pro Tools with the live album, but since then I've done everything in in a new one by UAD called Luna, which for me is the best user interface. It's set out like an analog board, and it, it just sounds so great. You have, it doesn't have a lot of bell, bells and whistles like, like Pro Tools and like Logic and Cubase and everything, because they only brought it out during lockdown. They thought, well, you know, people need something new. Let's put this out now. And they apologize saying, look, it's not at a great stage, but it's fairly stable right. and we'll let you use it, you know, yeah. because it, it comes free if you have a UAD interface. Sounds great. Yeah. And so I was using that. And um, while I was mixing the live album, Dave Cousins phoned me and said, look, Cherry Red have said they want a live studio album. Uh, they want a studio album. And can you, will you stop mixing the uh, live album and produce an album for us? Nice. And I said, yeah, of course, you know, it's great. It's like, you know, a dream come true. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I can actually get asked to do something instead of co-producing or whatever. Yeah. Just, the, you know, you we need one person in charge. Everybody's going to be set. I'll be writing out the songs in the first place. And um, I will do a basic template for you. Uh, we'll, and then he said, tell me what I have to do. And I said, well, work out a BPM for the song and put a click track down. Yes. I said, play your acoustic and then put your vocal on. Right. I said, the basic ideas and send me that. And right. then I can put it together. I said, don't worry about going off the click track or anything. I said, it's there as a guide for me to put things together more than for you to actually play right. to a section. Right. right. And um, I said, but it will help if you can keep in time. <laughs> but um, anyway, and that's what we did, you know. And he said, oh, you know, what gear can I have? And so he, he got an, he had a Neumann mic already, which is not the, not an 87 or anything. It's what I have one here, actually. It's the same. I forget the model number, but it's about 650, 680 pounds. Yeah. And it's, and it's really nice, actually. I really like it. It's great. Yeah. So we had that set up and I said, I've got a Zoom four track. I said that I love using. I said, he said, oh, a Zoom, okay, I'll get that. So he got himself a Zoom HD4 and um, learned how to use it. And uh, he would uh, set up a click track on, on his iPad into the headphones. He'd set up a vocal mic and he would plug his guitar in to the inputs on the Zoom. Nice and send me the individual files from that. Fantastic. Just to, clarify, just to clarify for the audience. So he laid down his guitar and vocals and the, to the click, and then you built the track around him. And then the, the other, well, you, you were 
then able well, to redo vocals and and add other instruments, etc. Well, what would happen generally is he'd send it to me, and he said, "What do you think?" Sometimes I'd say, "Oh, it's too slow or it's too fast. Let's change the BPM," and he'd do it again. And then I'd say, "Look, ch send it to Charles Cronk." Then he would send to Charles Cronk, and he would uh, sort of sort out Dave's guitar. And then he would put the bass down and then send it to me. So we had the structure of a song. So we had a little bit of a problem in the beginning uh, because Tony Fernandez was in Portugal and didn't have a drum kit. So I couldn't put down drums straight away. So sometimes I would just put down a guy drum track. Just I would try and find a feel that I thought was <clears throat> right. So we could just progress with that while we sorted out a drum kit for Tony. In the end, we actually had to send in rolling pads. You know, it was a pretty decent kit that uh, David found in England and got sent over to Portugal. But we had to press on in the meantime. And then we'd send it uh, to Dave Lambert. He'd put a lead guitar on. Um, maybe uh, if Dave then would try and get a, a more or less finished vocal or a really good guide, and right. the guys would put harmonies on if it was necessary, or Dave would put a harmony on as well. And we just built up the track by them, have it, everybody would have a copy of it, and they would add their parts and then send yeah. it all back to me. Right. I would sit there and have to decide what would be used, what, what didn't. It sounds fantastic, and, and the way that you worked sounds very sensible. So Blue, what's all this about rap music? Well, uh, about three years ago, I was walking out of my house one day and this young guy came up to me and said, oh, excuse me, um, you're Blue Weaver. And I said, yeah. He said, do you know, he said, uh, I'm a big fan uh, of the Bee Gees. He said, but I want to learn how to make music. I want to learn how to produce. I want to learn what you do to make music in the studio. He said, uh, I'm an IT specialist by the day, he said, but I have a record deck and he said, I have um, uh, lots of, he collected Akai MPC uh, machines. And he said, what I do is I sample vinyl records. He said, I take like a kick here and a snare and a little bit of something here and I create beats, he said from them. And he said, um, I'd love, for you to hear some. But he said, what I'd love to do is just sit in your room and watch and see how you, you know, what you do and see what equipment you use and things, you know. So anyway, I, I forgot about it. And I was working uh, then on tour for, you know, six months of the year, most of the time. So I didn't have anything, but he sort of persisted over the years calling me and everything. And then one day I thought, okay, yeah, come on, come on in. And he sat down and he brought me his beats and started playing me what he does. And I thought, gosh, this is like I used to do in the Fairlight, you know, <laughs> and pick up bits of samples and create tracks and everything. But he was creating grooves. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. And then he said, well, I've got contact with these rappers and everything. He said, can we do a track? He said, I've got um, guys in Philadelphia he said they were the, the they were really well known. He said um, ten years ago they were the youngest rappers on the scene. They were called the youngsters. And anyway, he said I want to get them back in into the scene. He said they've got so many followers. But he said we'll do a track. And he gave me this beat, and I added some. In fact, actually, I put big string sections on it, and uh, which was unheard of. The guy, the <laughs> yeah. guy said, "Oh, you can't do that." I said, "Well, I've done it. Take a listen." And in fact, they liked it in the end and we put it out and we put it on Spotify and all the media and um, we, and it was a big success. They're all their old fans were buying it. Um, we thought, and this young guy, Nasib, he's, he's, he's called, he's amazing. He said, look, this money we're making from Spotify, we're going to press vinyl, he said and put vinyl and sell vinyl. I said, what? He said, yeah, we're gonna make a vinyl single. So I did another mix and called it, and the song was called Be Great. So I made a B side of it and called it Be Great Too. And it's by the, the youngsters, you can check it out on Spotify. Yeah. And in fact, I like Be Great Too because by this time I'd got into it and I could do a bit more than 
in the beginning. It was a couple of months uh -huh. late. So we pressed vinyl. Um, we made money on Spotify. Fantastic. Paid for 500 vinyl pressings. Wow. that cost seven euros each. And the first ones we sold a hundred to a shop in Berlin for 15 euros each. Nice. We were paying 25 euros individuals uh, and another couple of other shops. Uh, Nasib got on to all these, all the, the vinyl shops in Germany and America and everywhere. And we, we got rid of all of them, you know. Wow. Uh, Blue, I can't tell you how happy I am that you've taken the time to do this. Great stories, great stuff. Can only say thanks and blue forever. And uh, thank you so much for doing this. You're welcome. Thank you.